Hebrews chapter number 6. I'm going to read a few verses, beginning in verse number 17. <clears throat> the Bible says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, by the way, we don't have time to get into everything that's in these verses. We'd be here until next Christmas. But beginning in verse number 17, get to play a definition game. The Bible says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. Right before this, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, most importantly it was written by the Holy Ghost, but whomever wrote this letter right before this talked about men on earth require an oath of another man as consolation or a surety that whatever they promise to do, they're going to do it. Well then, he goes into verse number 17, wherein God more, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. In other words, God wasn't satisfied with an oath. Right? God was more willing, in fact he was abundantly willing Right to prove to whom? It says, unto the heirs of promise. Who's that? Them people that received Jesus. We just talked about singing in the song. Right? The preacher just talked about he was the one that was promised. Well, who are the heirs of the promise? Those that received him, the promised one. So it's talking about saved folk. And it says, God was more willing to show to you how serious or how much he really meant to do what he promised to do that it says in verse number 17 and again in verse number 18, the immutability of his counsel. Now what's that word immutability mean? Immutability means that it's undefilable. It's unchangeable. Right? It's steadfast and sure. Immutability or something that is immutable cannot change. Time can't turn it into something different. Erosion won't chip away at it. Right? You can chuck whatever it is that you think will cause that to change. The only thing that's going to change is that you're tired at the end by trying to change it. You cannot change it. It's settled forever. Right? What did God promise that he exalted his word above his own name? That it's forever settled in heaven. It is unchangeable. Right? Well, look in verse number 18. That by two immutable... God didn't just promise it by one immutable thing. He had promised it by two immutable things. Right? Isn't that just God to outdo it? Because his ways are above our ways. He does all things well. But what are those two immutable things? What were they intended to do? That by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. Keep in mind, he's talking to saved folk. What he's trying to get across to people is that when God promised everything that he promised to you, first he promised that Jesus would come, then Jesus promised that they'd you know, try to kill him, but he'd lay down his life, and then he'd take it back up three days later. And then he promised that if he went to prepare a place for you, that he would come again and receive you unto himself. Right? All those promises, God gave you a strong consolation through two immutable things. What's that consolation? Well, another word for consolation is assurance. Right? No wonder the songwriter wrote, Blessed Assurance. Right? We taught on that not so long ago. Our assurance is so assured that nothing in heaven, nothing in earth, nothing under the earth can ever change it because God settled it forever. Right? Our hope or our consolation in the fact that our salvation is real, that it's permanent, and that nothing we, God, or anybody, because God promised he wouldn't undo it. Nothing can change it. Why do we have that consolation, such strong consolation? Because of two immutable things. One, God promised it. And the second immutable thing, it's impossible for God to lie. It's one thing for me to make an oath to you. You know that sometimes I don't keep my oaths. 
right? Whether because I'm not able to fulfill what I promised, because maybe something came up that prevented me from doing it. I am human. There are things that can get, I may be sorry enough just not to do what I promised to do. Right? That's one of the signs of the end times that truth breakers or truce breakers. Right? If you make a promise, you break it, that's a sign of the end times. Used to, man's handshake was worth, handshake was worth something. Used to, if somebody promised to do it, they'd do it. Right? But this isn't a man that has promised these things unto you. This is God. Right? Not Balaam, not some you know, graven image made by the hands of man, not that golden calf that Aaron made out of all those earrings when the children of Israel came out. No, we're not talking about a lowercase g God. We're talking about Jehovah, right? The one who framed the worlds. The one who had a you know, meeting between him, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost one day way in the alpha of time and decided that Christ would be the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Your salvation had already been signed off, stamped, and approved, purposed by God to fulfill it long before he ever said, let there be light. Right? God's the one that promised it to you. But then the second immutable thing is that God can't lie. Not only did he promise it to you, it's impossible for him to lie. Nothing that he has said since or ever will say will ever change the fact that he promised that if you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Can't change it. Once you get saved, can't undo it. That'll make the Calvinists mad. That'll make those that believe you can lose your salvation angry. If you're in, you're in. Not by my word, but by thus saith the Lord. Why do you think it's so important that everything we do is based off of what he said? Because it's impossible for him to lie. If God said it, you can build your life on it. If God said it, that's a check that you can take to the bank in cash not going to bounce God didn't just do it by two of, or one immutable thing he did by two so that you could rest assured and have strong consolation you know what the difference between some consolation and strong consolation is some consolation will get you through a day but then you're up thinking about it the next night on whether or not it's really going to come to pass some consolation will make you feel better in the moment but you won't feel better for long Strong consolation, regardless of what happens in your life, you're sure of it. In fact, you yourself couldn't convince you that it's not true because you're so sure about it. You've received such strong consolation that it doesn't matter who asks a question, what question they ask. Deep down in the gable end of your soul, you have strong consolation. You're sure of it. To console someone is to convince them of something. Right? What's another word to convince somebody? Conviction. If the Holy Ghost convicts you or convinces you that your blessed assurance truly is assured, that there's nothing that can change it, it doesn't matter what comes against you, doesn't matter what you face in your life, if it's settled down in here by the Holy Ghost, man can't undo it. Because it's a work of God. If you have that strong consolation from God, only God could undo it, and God promised that what he does, he doesn't undo. Yeah, well, goes on to say, he gave strong consolation to those who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before them. Do you want to know why salvation is such a miraculous thing? Because of what a person has to do to overcome to receive it. You know why God had to give you a measure of faith? Because you wouldn't have been able to stir up enough faith to believe on Christ on your own. God gave you the key to exercise in order to receive Christ. He did everything. All you had to do was receive Him, to believe on Him. Well, you know what? That faith allows a person that was dead in trespasses and sins to become an heir of the promise. It's right here at the end of verse number 18 who had fled for refuge. God opened their eyes of where they were and they want to run away from it. They realize that where they are, they're an abomination to God. And they want to run to be forgiven for those things which God has revealed to them they're guilty of. And they didn't just flee, they fled for refuge. That means that they weren't able to overcome what they were facing. 
somebody that's a refugee, if they're fleeing to a city of refuge in the Bible, it means that they can't change their situation. But there's a place where they can be protected. There's a place that they can get to where they can be safe. Well, where's that place? It's called Calvary. And they fled, it says, for refuge, to lay hold upon the hope set before us. What was that hope? Christ. They ran to Calvary to lay hold upon him. In other words, to receive. To lay hold upon means that you got it. If you lay a hold on something, somebody can't take away from you. You sat on it. Right? It brings the memory of the passage where David told the armies to pull back, but Uriah the Hittite, he's a fighting man. He wasn't going to pull back. And the Bible says he fought until his hand claved to the sword. That means he couldn't have let go of it if he wanted to. Literally, it meant that his, the muscles in his arms cramped to the point to where it was impossible for him to let go of that sword. If you lay a hold of Christ, more importantly, if Christ lays a hold on you, there's nobody that can cause that to be separated. In this little description there, what happens at salvation, you forsook all in the world and laid hold on him. You stopped trusting in whatever it was that you could do. And you ran to refuge, to a place where you could be protected from those things that are stronger than you. What's that? Sin, death, the world, the devil. There's a whole lot of things that are stronger than Brother Jordan this morning. But I ran to a place where I received refuge. A place where I am accepted and protected. Not because of what I did, but because of what Christ did for me. And then it says verse number 19. Talking about that hope, right? That strong consolation. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. And which entered, entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest, forever after the order of Melchizedek. Right? It says that Christ, being our forerunner, entered into the place that we could not enter into. What's that? That's what's behind the veil in glory. You know who's allowed to go behind the veil? The high priest. Who's the high priest? Well, we just read it in verse number 20. He was made a high priest forever. Can't undo it, because that's the way God does it. But he was made our high priest to enter into that which was within the veil, Right, why, verse number 19, which hope we have as an anchor. Why is that hope an anchor? Because nowhere in the process, from design to execution to delivery, were we involved in any of what it took for you to be saved. You know what you had to do? You had to believe. God took care of the rest. From the design and the alpha of time to everything that was done in Christ's life here on earth when he was robed in flesh to what he did once he went to heaven and what he's done ever since. As he's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Why? Because he's our high priest. That's what the high priest did. That everything about it is dependent on what God did, not what you did. Right? Take... A little example here. Okay, if... Now, nah, we're a bunch of rednecks. Let's talk about guns, okay? If I go out and buy a gun, that's just hypothetically, let's say we go out and buy a Colt 1911, okay? Go back old school. Right, 45 caliber, handgun, single stack magazine, right? When I pull the trigger, I'm the one that makes it go boom, but it's not because of what I did. I pulled the trigger. That's why the gun went off, if it was loaded. But the reason that the gun works is not because I pulled the trigger. The reason the gun works is because there was a gunsmith somewhere up in Massachusetts where Colt's factory is that, one, designed it, two, made all the components for it, went through all the troubleshooting process of prototyping it, then, once he perfected it, he started mass producing it and selling it. It goes off because it was assembled the right way, because it was designed the right way, 
because it went through all of the quality control so that when I pull the trigger, it goes boom and sends a bullet that way and not go boom and cause gun parts to fly into me. Right? The, duck, the gun doesn't go off because I pulled the trigger. The gun goes off because of who made it. Right? Your salvation is not about you receiving Christ. Right? That's why you got saved. But the reason that your salvation works, the reason that it lasts, the reason that when you pulled the trigger to accept Christ, you were able to receive him, was because everything that was designed, the way that it was executed, and the way that it was delivered and offered to you. And it's reliable. Doesn't matter how many times people get saved. They pull that trigger, they get saved. Well, well. it says, Which hope we have for an anchor for the soul, both steadfast and sure, which entereth into that within the veil. Doesn't say that our anchor is in the veil. The veil is the thing that separates God from man. The veil was a symbol. That's why when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. Something that no man could do. That fabric was as thick as the width of a man's hand. Well, there's a veil in heaven that you couldn't have passed through. Even if you got to heaven, there's a place in heaven that there's a veil that only one man could have entered. Who was that? Christ Jesus. But it says that our anchor, in verse number 19, it says, which entereth into that within the veil. There's something behind the veil that our anchor entered into. Our anchor's not in the fact that God's holy and is separated from sin-cursed man. No, 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 no. Go back and study the design of the temple that God gave unto Moses and then with the tabernacle and then once the temple was made. You know what's inside of the veil? The mercy seat. What's the mercy seat? That's the place where the blood was applied. You know where our anchor is today? It's not in the veil. It's not in the high priest. It's in the blood. Remember, we already talked about God himself is immutable. God gave you two immutable proofs that what he said was true so that you could have a strong consolation in your salvation. God being immutable, guess what the blood of Christ is? Immutable. Can't be tainted. Can't be changed. Nothing that happens to it can ever change the fact that that is the shed blood of the Lamb of God. Why do you think Jesus said when Mary saw him in the garden, when he revealed himself unto her, he said, don't touch me for I have not yet ascended. He's saying, I got to make sure I'm immutable so that when I put the blood on the mercy seat in glory, it's immutable. Nothing has tainted it. Why is that so important? Because you can take strong consolation. How strong of consolation? It's so strong that verse number 19 tells us that we have an anchor. Right? Which that hope we have as an anchor of the soul. It's a consolation or it's a hope. It's an assuredness so strong that it is the anchor for your soul study your Bible. Guess how many times you're going to find the word anchor in the Bible? One. Right here. You think God used it by accident? No. What image did God want to get through about that hope or that blessed assurance that you have of your salvation? That it's real? That it's going to last? That nothing can change it? That your salvation in itself is immutable? He wanted to get it across so strong that he used the word anchor. You know who can move an anchor? The captain of the ship. Once an anchor drops, doesn't matter how strong the wind blows, doesn't matter how big the waves get, an anchor's staying where the anchor is. Right? If you've ever been on a boat and you drop anchor, your faith isn't in the fact that the boat doesn't move. The boat can still move around. Boat can be moving in circles all over the lake. It don't bother you as long as you know that the anchor's still down there. Because the anchor keeps you from going any further than what the anchor's going to let you go. Right? Your assuredness, your consolation in your salvation is such that it doesn't matter where God moves you, doesn't matter what God allows you to encounter, doesn't matter who comes against you, you know that your anchor ain't moving. 
Now, if you're in a cruise ship and you throw out an anchor made of foam, it's just going to float on top of the water. You don't have a very, very good anchor. If you saw that, you wouldn't have much consolation in the fact that that anchor is going to keep you from going anywhere. Right? An anchor has to be able to hold. You know why anchors are shaped the way that anchors are shaped? So that when they drop them into the seabed, they dig in. It's not just sitting on the surface, because if your anchor is just sitting on top of the ground, when the boat starts pulling, it can start being pulled with it. It digs into the seabed. It roots itself so that it cannot be moved. No wonder the psalmist said that, I'll be like the tree planted by the waters. How can he say that? Because he knows where his anchor is. He knows that the wind may cause the tree to bend, may cause some branches to snap, but he knows I'm not going anywhere because I know my anchor's not going anywhere. I may bend and I may break, but my roots, I know where they go down to. Where? They go to that place inside the veil. That place that nobody can get to it and touch it because there's only one person that can enter in, and that was Christ. And Christ promised that when he entered in, it was to make that anchor, not to undo it. But see, an anchor is all well and good. But see, part of the anchor is the chain. What good's an anchor if it's not attached to the boat? You know why God gave you two immutable things so that you would have strong consolation? He didn't just make the anchor. He promised that the anchor would be attached to you. Aren't you glad you don't have to hold on to your own anchor? Aren't you glad that your salvation isn't dependent upon how strong you can hold on to the anchor? No, God said, I'll make the anchor and I'll make the thing that attaches it to you. That's called the Holy Ghost. When you got saved, what were you? You were sealed with the Holy Ghost. You know what that means? The Holy Ghost got you like this. Bible says we're in His hand. His hand's in the Father's hand. Every link between you and heaven is a promise from God that it's not going to fail. Your strong consolation isn't dependent upon the fact that you lived good enough today not to lose it. Or that you lived good enough today that you didn't get disconnected by the, or from the anchor. That one of your chains didn't give out because you forgot to tend to it. No, every chain between me and glory, every chain's the promise of God. Every chain is kept by the power of God. For the sole purpose of God that I can have strong consolation that I'm not getting disconnected from the anchor. Well, we've said all that to say this. Look with me again, verse number 19. Talking about our hope. It says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Doesn't say that it's an anchor for the ship. Doesn't say that it's an anchor for your worldly life. It says it's an anchor for your soul. A lot of ships come through a storm and they don't look like ships afterwards, but they're still hanging around because of the anchor. You know why an anchor is important? Because of the fact that there are souls on board a ship. The anchor is not to keep the boat safe. The anchor is to keep the people on the boat safe. All said and done, you can build another boat. You only got one soul. Too many people focusing on the boat, not enough people focusing on the anchor. So with the Lord's help, we're going to teach this morning on the anchors, what's important. Where are you tied to that anchor within the veil? That anchor that's sure and steadfast. The anchor that's never going to give up. It's attached deep down in the gable end of you to your soul. It's not attached to your heart, not attached to your mind, not attached to your body. It's attached to your soul. You know what that ship is a picture of? That's a picture of your body. The anchor's not attached to the ship. One of these days, ship's going into the ground. We're made of dirt. Ship's going away. It's going back to the ground which it came from. You know what's going to go to glory because it's been anchored? Your soul. One of these days, God's going to make you a new body. One fit for one that's made in the image of his son. 
The ship's not what important. It's your soul. You know why God anchored your soul? Because as the soul goes, so the person goes. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Wherever a man's treasure is, that's where his heart will be also. You know why your soul is anchored? Because your soul, if left up to you, be wandering around in the waters. We're fickle people. Right? A lot of us got that ADD ability that we see a squirrel and all we want to do is go chase it. Right? God anchored us because God knew that we needed to be anchored. But what did he anchor? He anchored your soul. Now, taking that picture of the ship, too many of us, we're looking at the sails. You know what the sails do? The sails drive you to where you want to go. Sometimes God causes a storm to come by and tear up your sails so that you end up going where God wants you to go. When the sails are gone, you're at the mercy of the tides. You know who controls the tides? God. You know what the sails do? The sails allow you to capture the wind and drive the ship where the, you want to let it go, where the captain wants to take it. Well, sometimes, because we're stupid, we insist upon taking the stern and saying, Lord, we'll captain this ship for a while. And in the Bible, what's the wind often associated with? The Holy Spirit. You know what sails allow you to do? To take what God's given you and do what you want to do with it. Just because you're behind the wheel of the ship doesn't mean that you're taking it where God wants you to go. Look at Jonah. Look at so many other people. in the Look at Samson. You think God gave him that strength so that he'd be found in the house of a harlot? No. But that's where he drove that ship. What God do? God tore up their sails. God said, you're not going where you want to go. You're going to go where I want to go. So many of us get so upset when the sails get torn. Well, I can't do this. I can't do that. You ever t stop to think maybe God doesn't want you doing that? What if you took your hands off of the wheel and said, Lord, wherever the wind takes us, that's where we're going. Whatever you want to do. It's not about me being comfortable. It's not about me chasing after my own desires. Lord, I know that I'm anchored deep down in here. Do whatever you want to with the ship. It's just a body. The Apostle Paul prayed three times for a thorn to be removed. Maybe he was praying for his sails to be mended. You know what God said? My grace is sufficient for thee. After the third time, Paul said, All right, God's grace is sufficient for me. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. When a ship comes into harbor and it don't have any sails, somebody knows that that ship got there by something other than the captain. If they see me on the ship, they're not too impressed. Not what I got just steered it into port. But when the boat shows up without any sails, how'd it get here, God? When the boat shows up to a place that it's got no business being, because God told it to go there, business is about to pick up. When you embrace the fact that I may not want to go there, but it's God's purpose for me to go there, you stop caring about the sales. Of course, obedience is greater than sacrifice. But if God has to take your sales away to get you to where you're supposed to be, you're still anchored. It's not about the sales. It's not about driving the ship where you want it to go. You've been bought with a price. Your ship is his ship. Your destination should be his destination. But yet we get so fixated on fixing the sails that we keep God from taking us where God wants to get us to. We think, well, without a sails, it's not a ship. Oh, it's still a ship. It's still going to go where God wants it to go. Well, it's all about the anchor. What else about a ship? You got the sails. You also got the wood. There's an old thought experiment about Theseus's ship. Old Greek tale. There was a ship that was shipwrecked. It was owned by Theseus. That's why it's called Theseus's ship. And one by one, 
they replaced all the bad planks on the ship with new planks and they threw them off into a pile well by the end by the time they were done there wasn't an original piece of wood left on the boat but it was still called Theseus's ship so the question is if you took all those old pieces of wood and put them back together which one's the real Theseus's ship you've got two identical ships made out of wood both of them go out there and float which one's the real one the answer is the one that the captain's on Theseus you'd say but they're the exact same but yeah there's just one problem Theseus ain't using that ship over there no more that's not his ship this one's his ship because that's the one that he's on right I don't care what type of it you talk about a wooden boat you talk about ships of war talk about submarine they don't leave port for long before things got to start getting fixed Right? The nature of a ship is that it doesn't last very long on its own. Right? Water is a powerful thing. Right? It can cause a lot. I think they said that you know a quarter inch of water, if it gets moving quick enough, can pick up a car and take it with it. Right? Water has a lot of energy behind it. Now imagine that you're fighting the water trying to get to where God wants you to get. Both going to get beat up. Even the ones that are made out of metal nowadays, they got to get repaired because salt water does a lot of crazy things to metal. They've got to replace pieces. Why? Because if they get rusted, water's getting through. It wasn't long after you got saved that eventually God had to replace a piece of wood. Had to replace a little bit of tackling or rope. We get caught up on the shape of the ship. Don't worry about the ship. ship's going to be okay. Because I know the one that owns it. Right? In fact, with our captain, it don't matter how beat up the wood really is. Go and read the story. Jesus was asleep in the hind part of the ship, head on a pillow. One of the few times you find him actually resting in a place where he can relax. Most of the time he had a stone for a pillow. But your Bible says that the ship was filled with water. You know what that means? Boat should have been sinking. But the master was on board. You ever stop to think that after he got, they woke him up and he said, peace be still? Because they decided that they didn't want to live off of faith because he said, we're going to the other side. Because they didn't dawn on it. These were, a lot of them, professional fishermen. They knew that the boat should have been at the bottom of the lake a long time ago. Yet it didn't stop to think, well, why in the world is this boat still floating? Because of who was on it. You ever stop to think that after they woke Christ up, that then they had to bail all the water out so that they could sail the boat? Boat was sailing before that because Jesus said it was going to the other side. After Jesus said, peace be still, he said, fine, you sail the boat. They had to get all the water out of the boat. They had to labor to get the boat the rest of the way across the lake. We're too worried about the shape of the boat. We should be worried about what's actually anchored. Boat can be destroyed. I mean, y'all know, threw my back out last week during the middle of Sunday school. It's just a back. God's still God. It's just a back. God used a surgeon to fix it once. If he wants to put me in a wheelchair... Blessed be the name of the Lord. You think I'm kidding. My hope is not anchored to my body. It's anchored to my soul. It's not about what shape the boat's in. In fact, there have been a lot of writers, a lot of preachers, a lot of examples through life that if you skipped into heaven, you didn't fight a good fight. We all ought to strive to make it to heaven beaten, bruised, right? Doing all that we could have done. Now another songwriter said that I'll bear in my body the marks of the cross to save this old child. What did Christ do? He took the afflictions of sin for you. What did he expect in return? He said, take up your cross and follow me. No man that carries a cross looks the same by the time he's done. Doesn't matter what you started off as at the end, it's going to look like you carried a cross. Anybody that lives a Christian life, their ship, it's going to look like it shouldn't float. Because that causes people to think, well, why is the boat still floating? 
God. If man could explain it, then God wouldn't be able to use somebody to reach the world. God has to do things that are above our finding out before we stop and look at a burning bush and say, now hang on a second. That bush should be burned up. Why didn't the bush burn up? Moses had enough common sense to go check it out. Guess what he found out? The bur bush wasn't burning because it was on fire. It was burning because the angel of the Lord was inside of it and wanted to talk to him. Right after marching around the city for six days and then seven times on the seventh day, man says, I don't, I've never seen a walled city come down because people walked around it for a while. Guess what happened when they blew them horns and they shouted? Walls came down. And they didn't just, you know, break apart and, you know, make a big mound of bricks. That could still be defensible by an army. Right? You ever heard of trenches? It's the same thing, except their trench would have been made out of stone. Still would have been pretty strong. No, your Bible says that they fell flat. So flat that Israel walked into the city. They didn't have to climb over nothing. What was that a testament to? The fact that God did it, not Israel. You know why Joshua, after they, you know, they bore up the ark, they started walking across the Jordan River, when they committed their feet to the water, waters parted. The Bible says Joshua made an altar, right? a stack of stones out there in the middle of the river. Why? So that when they got over to the other side, they could say, you know who built that? Joshua. Well, how'd Joshua get all them rocks out there to the middle of the river? How'd he keep the rocks in place while the waters were rushing over them? He didn't. God made the waters go away, and that's why that's out there in the middle of the river. That wasn't a work of man. That was a work of God. What did Moses tell the people of it? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see something that only God could do to deliver you. It was to prove to them that their God heard their prayers and that their God was the Jehovah God, the I Am. And yet you find them that after God's up there on the mountain talking with Moses for a little bit, they say, we don't want that God, we want our own God. Too many people want their boat to look like the nicest yacht in the neighborhood. If all you're trying to do is make your boat look like the world, you missed the point. You know what your boat should look like? A battleship that's seen some action. Your boat should look like it's had some wear and tear. Because he did call us to be soldiers. And he told us to stand. You know why he told us to stand? Because as long as you're anchored, you can stand as long as you need to. We're too focused on how pretty the boat looks. I got news for you. If y'all don't own a mirror, okay, y'all not that impressive. I've seen better. No offense, just true. But we're all aware of that fact. So why do we toil with wood, hay, and stubble trying to lay it up and make it last for forever? You can try and make your boat look as nice as you want. You're just begging God to come by and cause a storm to cause it to look like it should. A vessel of honor is meant to be used. Do you know what used boats look like? They look worn. They look like they've seen some hard times. Because you get out there on the ocean, you're not in charge anymore. The wind, the seas are in charge. If you're in naval warfare, you don't get to decide how many holes get knocked into your boat. The enemy decides that. But through it all, God promised that the boat would still float. Because he anchored you. Some made their boat into what they wanted it to be. God says that he turned them over to the destruction of the flesh, that the soul might be saved. You know why God cared about the soul? Because that's what was anchored. They didn't care about the boat. You know what this boat is? This flesh. This body that we have. It's a tool that we can use for God's honor and glory. Doesn't matter what shape you're in, there's something you can do for God. 
Doesn't matter how beaten, how bruised. If God tells your ship to sail, it's going to sail. And nobody can stop it from sailing, including you. We're too focused on the boat when really we should be focused on the anchor. When the holes get knocked in our boat, we ought to be praising the Lord that we've got an anchor that's not dependent on the boat. Think about the Apostle Paul and that storm that they named Eurachlodon. What was the good news that Paul came back with? Not a man's soul is going to be lost as long as everybody stays in the boat. But the boat's going to get broke. Now that don't make much sense to man. How's the boat going to go down but everybody still be saved? Because God said so. God said, I promise you're going to make it out of this alive. You know what he gave him? He gave him an anchor of hope. Right? Literally, he's talking about their life, but literally our soul's life, right? Our new life, that new creature that he made us. Nothing that the world can do. They can sink the boat. They can't sink me because I've got an anchor. I watched not too long ago. Found I went down a YouTube rabbit hole. Found a guy that did some diving, and then he works every now and then with law enforcement offices all across Texas that if they need a diver to go check out a lake or a river, they call that guy. And then one day they pulled five trucks up out of this lake that guys had stolen ATMs and stuff and then sunk the truck that they used to do the robbery and put the ATM in the back of it, sunk it in the lake, trying to get rid of the evidence. They'd been there for a while too. You realize that your soul has an anchor and not the boat. Boat can be on the bottom of the ocean. They still got them trucks out the lake. It sunk. Engine didn't run. Right? One of the axles snapped. They had to use the other one. How'd they get it out? They got it out. They pulled it via a chain. When your boat's on the bottom of the water, but yet God still pulls it into port via the anchor, that causes people to get noticed. That causes the world to say, I'll stop and see what's going on over here. How in the world did you make it here? It wasn't by me. God just pulled me in because of the anchor. Boat went under, but I was still connected to the anchor. You say, Brother Jordan, that, that seems counterintuitive. Yeah, because God does things that doesn't make sense to man. If it made sense to man, it wouldn't require faith. You're focused on keeping the boat above water. What if God wants the boat to be under the water? What if God wants the boat to be pulled in in a way that only God could have done it? But you want to do it the way that it's always been done. You want to do it the convenient way. You want to do it the way that it makes sense to you. The boat's not important. The anchor's what's important. You know that your soul can never be destroyed? You know why? Because God gave it to you. God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. The soul is a gift from God. You know what your anchor is? A gift from God. You know what every link in between, the promise of God, you know what that is? It's permanent. There's nothing in this world, nothing in heaven, nothing under the earth. Doesn't matter which way you go trying to find something that can undo the fact that you are an ever-living soul, that your anchor is forever settled, and that God's promises can never be defeated that connect you to the anchor. Then you start realizing it doesn't matter what happens. Nobody can sever the connection between me and what's on that mercy seat, the blood of Christ. And if they can't undo the promises, there's nothing that keeps God from just pulling me in. It makes sense through the eye of faith. Because what is faith? The evidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things I've seen. You know why your anchor works? Because God promised that it would. But you know why it can be a consolation to you? Because you believe it. The anchor is important because that's the thing that keeps you what God made you into, the new creature. The anchor is the mechanism by which one day you're going home. 
Why do you think the Bible says that we're already seated in heavenly places? Because that anchor and you getting pulled into heaven, nothing's going to prevent that. In God's eyes, you're already there because it's already done. Your conversation's already recorded there. It's such a sure thing that God's already prepared a place for you at the marriage supper. He went to go, pre he promised the disciples, the apostles, he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Jesus, I don't know about you, but on the day of Pentecost, there's about 120 people there, right? That was praying in the upper room. Right? That was the church at that point. I don't know about you, but in 40 days, considering that in six days he made everything that we could ever see, if we built a telescope out far enough to see all the things that he created, right? Imagine after a couple of weeks how many mansions in glory he had already made. Right? He long completed their mansions in glory. Some of them needed them real soon. It's like Stephen. He needed his mansion a whole lot quicker than I did. But he promised that if he'd go to prepare a place for him, that he'd come again. He's already got theirs finished. You know why he didn't come back? Because he's working on yours. He's so sure of it that after he finished Peter's, he started working on yours. And John's and Stephen's and James and the rest of them. Why? Because through the eye of God being omnipotent, he knew who would believe on him. Long before you ever believed on him, I believe you had a mansion in glory. He's not waiting on him to finish building it. He's waiting on for all those to believe that will believe. I believe it's ready. I believe it's as ready today as it was a thousand years ago. I believe he prepared it. Because God doesn't do things in half measures. God does things completely. I believe he went, I believe he completed, and I believe he's just been waiting ever since for the Father to tell him to go and get him. That's how sure that Jesus was your anchor wouldn't fail. How sure are you that the anchor's all you need? Jesus didn't promise you a, we've heard it preached over and over, didn't promise you a bed of roses. He promised you that the world would despise you because it despised him. Job, right? Even though at one point he was the richest man in the East, and then afterwards God gave him twice as much. You know what Job's summation was? Man's days are few and full of trouble. Even on them days where he had everything, he still had trouble. Even on the days when God took it all away, he still had trouble. But through it all, he had an anchor. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God's still God regardless. And my anchor hadn't changed because God hadn't changed. How many of us, our attitude or our altitude as a Christian is dependent on what shape the boat's in? Jesus didn't promise you that the yacht would make everybody else jealous. Jesus promised you that if you got in the boat, you'd make it to the other side. Jesus promised you that if you accepted what he gave you, that it wouldn't fail you. You know why the boat's going to fail you? Because it's made out of the same stuff that you are. You know why the sails are going to fail you? Because the sails were made under the power of man. But you want to know why the boat keeps on moving? Because God promised that the anchor wouldn't fail, and you're on the boat. The only reason that the boat has any use is because until I leave it, it's what I'm using to get around. It's my choice on whether it can be used for the honor and glory of God. But study the lives of those that truly sold out. We don't know what persecution is. We barely know what resistance is. Right? And some faced a little bit of it during COVID and they folded. Look at the life of the Apostle Paul. You're telling me that in his body he wasn't broken by the time he got to Rome? They tried to kill him how many times? How many scars did he have from being beaten? They tried to break him physically, but they couldn't break his spirit. You're telling me that after... Look at the Apostle John. How many times they tried to tar and feather him? 
That you don't look normal after you get tarred and survive it. There are lasting impacts. But yet on the Isle of Patmos, where it's, what's he do? But on the Lord's Day, he's in the Spirit worshiping God. He wasn't worried about the shape of the boat. Right? This book of Hebrews talks about those our forerunners that were torn asunder. Right? Driven from their homes. Put on the lamb because they believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were so sure of their anchor that they wouldn't give up on that name. That they wouldn't quit preaching it or teaching it or going out and spreading it. What happened to them? They tried to destroy their ships. We encounter some choppy water and then we get upset. It's not about the boat. It's about the anchor. Let the world do what they want to to the boat. The boat's going to be what God wants it to be until God says, I'm off the boat. The boat's going to take me as far as God wants me to go. Doesn't matter if it's got sails or no sails. Doesn't matter if there's water coming in or if there's water going out. Doesn't matter if we're coasting across smooth waters or we're up and down in a hurricane, everything's topsy-turvy. You know what matters? That I'm anchored. The boat's going to get destroyed one day. Right? Use all the fossil fuels you want. Burn up as many trees as you want. It ain't lasting much longer. And one of these days, it's going to be consumed with a fervent heat. Well, too many of us have been busy working on our boat to show it off in port. Boats are meant to go sailing. And if you go sailing, you're going to encounter some hardness. And your boat ain't going to look the way that it did for long. Some things may get torn off. Then that begs the question, why was it added in the first place? Because if God put it there, it had stayed there. Why are you upset when the things that get removed from your boat, God didn't want there in the first place? Why are you upset when God says, hang on, we're going to do something that nobody else can explain so that you get to tell somebody about Christ? But your boat's more important to you than giving somebody else the good news of your anchor. When you're so fixated on what's going on on the boat that you miss the people that are bobbing out there in the seas of this world asking for somebody to throw them a life raft. Because one of these days we're going to have to stand before them and give an account. And either it's going to be all my faith was in the anchor or all my faith was in the boat. All my faith was in the sails. All my faith was in the weapons that God gave me on the boat. Study your Bible. God gives you one weapon. It's called the sword. The rest of everything else that he gave you was defensive. Too many of you loading up on anti-aircraft guns and loading up on torpedoes and cannons and everything else, and God says, we're getting rid of them. Because the world understands combat. The world doesn't understand somebody that can stand regardless of whatever the world throws at them. That's why he gave you the armor of God, not the armory of God. He promised that he would conquer our foes. David threw the sling, but God was the one that defeated Goliath. Joshua was the one that led the armies of God. God's the one that won the victories. There's a bunch of slaves that had no military training. They shouldn't have won them battles. Who won them? God. When we fight, we don't use the weapons of the world. What do we use? Sharp two-edged sword? That's able to cut away the lies and the blindness of the world and reveal unto them that they need a Savior. We ought to strive to be something special. You know what's special? A boat that goes places that's never been done before. They still talk about the first time Magellan sailed around the world. They still talk about people that sailed certain stretches of water that they thought were unsailable. Well, if you give your boat to Jesus, it's going to sail and it's going to do things that nobody else thought that it could do. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.